distinguished bishop, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Muir Russell and I'm the principal of the University of Glasgow. And it's a very great pleasure indeed to welcome you all to this very special evening here in the Butte Hall at the centre of the university. And it's my privilege and the main task I should do this evening to introduce to you our key conversationalists tonight. And I will then leave the explanation of the background and of the form of this evening to my colleague, Professor Mona Siddiqui. So first, a word of introduction about Mona. Mona Siddiqui is a graduate of Leeds and Manchester, and she joined the university here in 1996. And two years later, she founded the Center for the Study of Islam, which she currently directs. Her research interests cover such areas as classical Islamic law and law and gender, early Islamic theology and thought, contemporary legal and ethical issues in Islam, and modern Arabic literature. And she's well known for her broadcasting work, including regular radio appearances. And those of us who are addicted to the Today program will recognize that. And she writes frequently for the Scottish and the British press. She's currently the Jantina Tamas Visiting Professor at the University of Groningen. She's the chair of the BBC's Scottish Religious Advisory Committee. She's a member of the Commission on Scottish Devolution, that's the Kalman Commission, and she's a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on the Islam West Dialogue. And she's been the prime mover in making tonight happen, and we're very grateful to her for all the work and effort that she's put into it. And turning now to Rowan Williams, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury, I guess he probably needs little introduction, but here goes. He's a graduate of both Cambridge and Oxford, and was ordained a priest in 1978. And over the succeeding years, he combined academic appointments, first at Cambridge, subsequently at Oxford, with his work as a priest and a chaplain. In 1992, he was enthroned Bishop of Monmouth, and following eight years' service, he became the Archbishop of Wales. And in February 2003, he was enthroned as the 104th Archbishop of Canterbury, the first Welsh successor to St. Augustine of Canterbury. The Archbishop is acknowledged internationally as an outstanding theological writer, scholar, and teacher, and he writes extensively across a wide range of fields in philosophy and theology. He has in recent times turned his attention to contemporary cultural and interfaith issues, and indeed it is his participation in the Building Bridges project over the last five or six years that has established the link with Professor Siddiqui and has been the catalyst for tonight's event, and Mona will say a little more about that in the moment. On a personal level, I'm <clears throat> particularly delighted to welcome the Archbishop, as it finally gives me the opportunity to acknowledge a debt that I owe him. He doesn't know about this. Your Grace, you may remember a paper you wrote entitled Faith in the University, in a collection of articles entitled Values in Higher Education. And in that, you reasserted the intrinsic value of universities and of a liberal education and you suggested that the business of education is not just to learn about some object or activity. It is, you argued, much more than that. It is fundamentally about the student understanding his or own capacity as a questioner, as a learner, and about continuing on the path of discovery through life. But there was one phrase you used, which for me was full of intrigue and potential, that I quoted it in a number of my charges to the graduates at the last summer's graduations. For you suggested that in our continuing path of discovery, we should remain capable of surprising and being surprised. And it seemed to me that in an event such as this, a fascinating event with fascinating people, that this epitomizes the unique way that the university can act as a catalyst and bring people together for intellectual debate. And it's important for it provides that valuable and precious opportunity for each one of us to continue again on our path of discovery, suspending, at least for a while, our fixed positions and our comfort zones, and embracing new thoughts and new questions and new perceptions, making us, I hope, capable of surprising and being surprised. So thank you for that. And I'm sure that the magnificent attendance tonight suggests there are many who want to do just that and to enjoy a journey tonight through new ideas and new thoughts. So I will not stand between them and that journey any longer. And once again, 
on behalf of all of us here, can I thank you, the Archbishop and Professor Siddiqui, for allowing us to be part of the conversation that is about to take place. Thank you. Principal, thank you. I'm just going to say a few words um, before the conversation starts. I'd like to thank, first of all, the staff at Glasgow University and the staff at Lambeth Palace, first of all, for coordinating this event. But a special thanks to Claire Laidlaw, uh, who has been an immense help in getting this event to run as smoothly as it has been so far. It's a huge honour for me to welcome uh, Archbishop Rowan Williams to Glasgow, and an even greater privilege for me to be able to have this public conversation on home ground. Ten years ago, the then head of the Theology and Religious Studies Department, Dr. Alistair Hunter, advised me to establish the Centre for the Study of Islam so that Islamic studies could become a key focus of the department. And as a junior lecturer, I obeyed. And I'm very pleased that this conversation today marks ten years of the Centre's work. Several people have asked me, how did this come about? The simple answer is, at least for my part, through friendship, through learning, especially through a series of Christian Muslim seminars called Building Bridges, in which Archbishop Rowan and I have been working together for the last five years. The seminar brings together every year a group of international scholars, Muslim and Christian, who meet in different parts of the world to talk about scripture, faith and practice. And some of you may already be saying, no, not more dialogue. And I acknowledge that dialogue is a loaded word, often imbalanced, often plagued by all kinds of personal and political agendas. But as someone who has over the years felt an ethical pull in this direction, I too approached this personally and professionally with some reservation, even some cynicism. But over the years, building bridges has had a transformative effect on me. I have looked at aspects of my own faith critically. I have discovered far greater depth of meaning in Christianity than before. And I have been humbled by the echoes I hear in both faiths, how people of faith keep God alive in their daily lives. I have realized, to paraphrase Archbishop Rowan's own words from a sermon he gave in Cambridge this year, that faith is most fully itself when it stops you ignoring things. But most of all, I have built friendships with people whose words, whose generosity and whose humility have changed me over the years. And that is why, uh, what I understand by dialogue. And I hope this event will give you the opportunity to hear some of the wisdom that I have cherished, perhaps even taken for granted over the last few years. Just a brief word about the format. The format is that I will speak with the Archbishop for the first half an hour. And then after that, um, those of you who want to ask a question, if you raise your hand while we're having this conversation, Claire will give you a little card and a pen to write a question. And after half an hour or so, we will ask the Archbishop to select from the questions that have been put forward. Because time is limited, I would urge you, however, not to ask questions that I've already covered or the Archbishop has responded to in the first half. So once again, may, uh, may I ask you to enjoy the evening and out of courtesy, could you please switch off your mobile phones? Thank you. So, Archbishop, welcome. Thank you. I suppose my first question would be that you've had a fairly eventful year, with perhaps a few more headlines than you would have liked. But I'd like to start asking about the Lambeth Conference earlier this year. At the end of all that we read about schisms and disintegration of the Anglican Communion, where do you think we are now? Is the Communion stronger, or has it been irreparably, irreparably divided between Conservative and Liberal Anglicanism? I think a lot of people were expecting um, more drama from the Lambeth Conference. And those of you who know that um, great work of literature called Albert and the Lion will remember that when Albert went with Mr. and Mrs. Ramsbottom to Blackpool, there was no wrecks and nobody drowned. In fact, nothing to laugh at at all. And I feel there was a bit of that in the Lambeth Conference. No wrecks and nobody drowned. Um, but positively, what was achieved was, I think, Two things. One was people were able to hear from each other a willingness to work together even at a time of real stress and difficulty. 
a willingness to, to make the communion work. And secondly, we're able to rebuild some of the broken trust that had damaged our life together over the years. And if you think that the lack of real trust between people from the Global South and people from the North or from the United States, trust between people who might call themselves traditionalists and who might call themselves liberals, the breaking of that trust was at the heart of the problem, then putting a little bit back into the bank on that, that basis was surely worth doing. So I think those, those were the achievements. I don't think we're going to divide. I think the problems won't go away, and we still have a huge number of issues to deal with. But perhaps the, the basis of relationship on which we address them is a bit stronger. But do you think that throughout the conference and the events leading up to the conference, that in a way you ask people to make an extremely difficult choice between loyalty to the communion and freedom to exercise their conscience? That's a very searching question. I think that anyone who belongs in a global church, an international church, is bound at some point to be faced with some tension about this. There are things that you may believe with immense passion and strength. And you have to weigh up whether that passionate commitment out, outweighs, out trumps, as you might say, the commitment to staying together for the sake of a coherent witness in the world. I don't pretend that's an easy choice, but I don't think that it was quite as, you know, mm -hmm. yes or no as that for the Lambeth Conference. I was, I think, trying to suggest that for those on the left, those who want to see radical change, the question might be, do you want the communion to move on this together? Because if so, you might need to have the patience to address these issues inch by inch rather than, you know, a quick change? Or are you content just to change yourself, your neighbors, the people like you? And I think that's, you know, that's a real question. Do you want the church to move together or just one or two bits of it? If you want the church to move together, then there's work to be done in that building of relations. Would you say that um, GAFCON pose any further threat to the communion? For those who might not know what GAFCON is, perhaps I could just... Of course. Um, this was the conference of mostly um, Anglicans from the developing world, with some from Australia and America joining in, who on the whole took a very much more strongly traditional line than some in Britain and the United States, who met in the Middle East earlier this year. I felt that that was not actually a serious threat to the Lambeth Conference. I may be being idealistic here, but it does seem to me that if a group wants to gather and discuss and shape a common mind, that's fine, so long as they're not simply cutting off lines of communication. So I think that that was a significant rallying point for some. I think what came out of it was, was mixed, as what came out of the Lambeth Conference was mixed. Um, I'm meeting some of those who were most heavily involved in that very soon. We continue the conversation. So I, I don't see it as a, you know, a huge threat to the integrity of the communion. Okay. Slightly different subject, but I think which made even bigger headlines. When you gave your lecture at the Royal Courts of Justice in February this year, did you have any idea that the press would react the way they did? And can I quote one of the things you said in your sermon on Rudyard Kipling in 2006, when you said, sometimes when Kipling tried to spell out in prose what he thought he was most deeply about, he said things that were neither coherent nor edifying. Would you say that notwithstanding the sensational media reporting with some voices even calling for, your, for you to quit, that you really did know what you were saying? <laughs> yes, thank you for that. <laughs> <clears throat> well, that, you know, that's at least 10 minutes in before the, the lecture was mentioned. <laughs> um, to the first question, did I expect the reaction? I expected um, a lot of criticism, frankly, and a lot of discussion. I didn't, I think, quite expect the level of um, what felt a bit like public hysteria for a couple of days. I didn't expect that, and it wasn't all that easy to deal with. 
Did I know what I was doing, I think, or what I was saying? Well, I hope so. Um, but it, it does illustrate the fact that, of course, as I've sometimes said, the Archbishop of Canterbury, like it or not, is never just talking to the audience in front of him. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, the, the echoes, the resonances go out. It was a lecture which was designed as part of a series on um, Islam and British law. It was the first lecture in that series. It was a lecture that was written with quite a lot of consultation, in spite of what's been claimed, with a number of people in the religious studies world and the legal world. And of course, as the Lord Chief Justice helpfully made clear some months later, um, the substance of it wasn't um, all, that, all that drastic. What I wanted to do was to raise a certain kind of question, not just about Islamic law, but about the place of religion in British law. And there are quite a number of tough questions around that. And in the course of that, wanted to raise a question as to what the limits might be of some kind of legal ratification in this country of some aspects of community law, particularly Sharia law. Um, I raised, for instance, the question of how we would understand freedom of conscience, the question of the place of women in all this. And you know, those are serious questions about how the law of this religious community and the law of the land might fit together or not. Um, I, didn't, I don't think I had any answers at the time. I don't have many answers now. Do you think that it's become almost impossible in the current climate in, in the UK, as well as in Europe, but I think largely in the UK, to have any coherent discussion about religion in public life without it mm. becoming sensationalized? Well, it would be a pity if that were true. I rather hope it's not, in spite of February. Um, I, I realize the word Sharia is, of course, a, a red button. And my attempt to say, well, look at how it's actually used and what it actually means, was singularly unsuccessful. But it would be a great shame if we just drew the conclusion that it was impossible to have that kind of reasoned discussion. And um, I'd like us to keep trying. OK. Um, moving into a different direction, which is one of the reasons why I wanted you to come here with your involvement and engagement with interreligious work. Why do you do it? We're living in a world where it's impossible to ignore your neighbor. Um, and if you're not going to ignore your neighbor, then there are good religious reasons for thinking that you ought to love your neighbor. And if you're going to love your neighbor, there are good religious reasons for thinking you need to understand your neighbor. That's the bottom line, I think. And we've just been talking about some of the myths and misunderstandings that bedevil talk about religion in public. Talking seriously, patiently, and at depth with people of other kinds of conviction is, I think, crucial for our health as a society, crucial for our health as religious communities as well. So that's certainly where I start. But um, I would underline in that that I would actually say there's a theological reason, a, a religious reason, a Christian reason for me for engaging in dialogue. It is part of the love of the neighbor. Has it changed you as a person, this kind of interreligious work? And not just as a person, but as a Christian in any way? I was very interested in what you said earlier about the friendships that form, the, the sense of, I suppose, the three-dimensionality of your partner in dialogue. At the human level, I think that's been the most important thing for me, as I think for you too. You, you read about the other, you read about the person who has different convictions, and very often it remains a bit two-dimensional. Then you spend time, then you watch somebody else praying, you watch somebody else engaging with their scripture, and you realize the, the three-dimensionality. So yes, humanly, that's, that's very important. Religiously and theologically, I think I'd point to a couple of things, um, and some of these you've heard me say before, so forgive me. Um, one is, I think, the importance of recognizing in interreligious dialogue that people of different religious convictions aren't necessarily trying to answer the same questions. It's not that everyone has the same examination paper and 
Christians answer it one way, Jews answer it another, Muslims answer it another, and somebody or other tries to sort out what the right answer is in the abstract. We begin with different problems, and our, our revelations, what we understand about our revelation, appears as, as an answer to different problems. Now, we don't stop there, but I think dialogue only really begins when we recognize that, and I've certainly been struck by that. I remember once, actually, you leaning across the table to me and saying, what is it that Christians mean by salvation? And it was a very important question to put so that I realized more deeply, well, it's not obvious. I've got to think about how to communicate this, why it's central for me, but not in the same way for a Muslim. The other thing which has come through, I've already, in a sense, touched on in a different frame, and that's that's what it means theologically to recognize in somebody in another faith community elements that I would call holiness. And quite recently, you, you know about the meeting we had in, um, in Cambridge a few weeks ago about the Common Word Declaration and the follow-up to that. And I had to address that meeting. And it was the experience of the Building Bridges seminars that pushed me there into thinking what does it mean to, to see holiness outside your own religious tradition? And it's a very tough question because everyone who's been involved in dialogue, I think, will recognize you see, you see someone else's face turned towards God and you see in their language and their life the kind of, I don't know, the kind of ethos, the kind of contour that makes you say, well, there's, there's something truly about God reflected in that life. That's what holiness means. Now, how do I make sense of that as a Christian who believes that relationship with God is ultimately defined in and through Jesus Christ? So just pushing that question about holiness has been part of the experience, part of how it's impacted on me. Well, actually, that leads me neatly into the next question. The one question which keeps coming up between Muslims and Christians is, as one theologian said, they may worship the same God, but their understanding of this God is so very different. Do you agree with this? And if so, what is the main difference that you see? The main difference between Muslims and Christians, obviously, is in the area of how you understand the unity of God. For the Christian, that unity is if you like, a bit more like the unity of a musical chord than the unity of one note struck on, on the piano or whatever. For the Muslim, that unity is axiomatic and all-defining and mustn't be compromised by any sort of internal relation or differentiation, as, as I see it. Now, that's, that's the main area of disagreement, and it, of course, is rooted in the way in which Christians came to understand Jesus Christ as divine, in some sense. So, a very fundamental gap there. And there are no negotiations that'll get us over that in a hurry. That being said, I think what, what we often forget is that the way in which Christians and Muslims talk about God is not, in spite of that huge and fundamental division, it doesn't sound as if we're talking about different kinds of thing, if you see what I mean. We're talking about a God who is utterly free, whose nature is both holy and merciful, who is the creator of the universe, who wills to engage with human creatures so that their lives are reconciled and, and made whole. Well, that's the God I think you would agree as a Muslim that we're talking about, just as when we're talking with our Jewish brothers and sisters, all of that would hold in the same way. That's why I say we're not talking about a different sort of thing. I, I was thinking about this, actually, on the way up today. Um, the story in the Old Testament of Elijah and the priests of Baal, the people of Israel are tempted to go and worship the god of the Canaanites, the god who's called Baal. 
and Elijah wants to draw them back to the worship of the God of Israel. And the, this great competition is set up on Mount Carmel. I'll call my God, you call yours, let's see who answers. The priests of Baal call on Baal, nothing happens. Elijah calls on the God of Israel and down comes the fire from heaven, QED. And the, the assumption of that is there are several rival claimants for the title of supreme God, put it to the test, here's your answer. Now, I don't sense that the dialogue between Jews and Christians, Christians and Muslims, feels like that at all. We're not saying you know, there's a whole set of competitors, we've got to make sure we've got the right one. We're talking, forgive the jargon, but we're talking the same grammar about God, about transcendence, about creation, about mercy and, and justice. We're talking about the same sort of reality. And yet, when it comes to spelling out how our relation with that reality is made possible, and therefore what more needs to be said about the character of that reality, our paths diverge because our histories are different and our starting points in history are different. But <clears throat> if, I, if I can push you slightly on that, um, when in your um, lecture in Cambridge two, three weeks ago, uh, you contrasted the self-emptying aspect of Christian faith built on the weakness of its founder with the Islamic narrative of trial and triumph. Can you just elaborate on that? Yes, um, I've already had my knuckles wrapped by some Muslim friends on that. No, I'm not <laughs> but, uh, no I, it's a very serious point. I, I was trying to say that it may sound as if when you use words like love, everybody knows what you mean. And I was exploring the way in which Christian language about love is very much shaped by a fundamental story of God's self-emptying, self-denial, coming into the world and the life of Jesus. The life of Jesus is a life, again, of emptying out of self, ending on the cross, and moving there into the fullness of resurrection. And the question I was asking was, how does that map onto a story of Muhammad going through trial but with victory at the end of it? Is it the same pattern of love that emerges in the two? And I don't know the answer. I just feel it's, it's worth looking at it in those terms. Um, does Islam have a dimension of talking about divine love, which is anything like what Christian theologians call kenosis, emptying? And from the responses I've had from some Muslim friends, clearly the answer is by no means clear cut. But I think it's a question worth looking at because it, it drives us to look at the shape of the basic stories and how they, they condition what we believe and what we do from there on. Um, just staying with this whole Muslim-Christian difference, I sometimes think when I'm in conversation with Christian colleagues that for the Muslim, the biggest theological challenge is to recognize the essential monotheism of Christianity in the Trinitarian view, despite the complexity of the Trinity. But in your view, what is the biggest challenge for Christians vis-a-vis -vis Islam? On the ground, I think one of the biggest challenges for Christians is to realize what Jesus means within Islam something which you know, Christians are still very, very slow and reluctant to grant. But that, that's a, a perception problem. I think the deeper problem is for Christians to recognize in Islam, it's not just about the arbitrary will of God and submission to that will. It is about, and you, you'll tell me if I'm wrong here, as I understand it, Islam is also about the mind and heart of God opening up to humanity through the, the gift of the Quran. And it's easy for a Christian to caricature the command and obedience model, as it is with Christians and Judaism, to be honest. You still hear Christians say, oh, Judaism is a religion of law, and all the rest of it, without the understanding that law for the Jew is gift the opening of God's mind and heart, and therefore the entry into the, you know, the proper harmony of the universe. And I feel that's, that's something Christians need to come to terms with more, more fairly. Okay. I'm going to um, ask a final question before I 
pick some questions from the um, audience. Just browsing through your web page, the official web page, I see that you are a person of eclectic intellectual passions, and poetry is one of them. Would you say that you're essentially a poet interested in religion, or a religious person dabbling in poetry? Oh. Dabbling in poetry. <laughs> Writing poetry. Writing poetry. <laughs> <laughs> well, some would say dabbing, I'm sure. Um, I wouldn't pull them apart. I, I am a person who is committedly Christian, whose concerns and passions express themselves in poetry. I did say, I think, when I published my first collection of poems, that I didn't say myself as, as a religious poet in the sense that I was trying to write poems about religion, but a religious person writing poetry, um, good or bad, but you know, it's, it's not confined by the religious subject matter. And that's, that's how I put the distinction, I think. But I, I wouldn't know where to start and stop in analyzing my, my sense of myself as a believer and as a, as a writer of poetry. Has anything ever dented your faith? Has anything ever happened regarding human suffering that's made you doubt either God or made you doubt humanity? There have certainly been periods where I've had very little sense of you know, tangible divine consolation, where the language has, has sounded hollow. Um, and th those have been times, I think, when I've been closest to, to the suffering or indeed the death of people who've been close to me. And you can go through quite long periods as a believer where you can feel the words are there. I don't want to fiddle around with them or try and make them easier. But at the moment, I can't give very much content to them. I know I've just got to soldier on and hope they come alive because I can't deny what they're about. I've never had a point, I think, where I felt there's nothing there. I give up on the whole thing. But there have been long patches, certainly, I suppose, in, in my middle 20s, when, when I, I found so much of the language f felt stale and, and stiff, and I couldn't put much into it. And you just carry on in silence, and you try and pray in a way that is open to what there is, the mystery that there is, and you trust. And um, if I can go to poetry for a moment, George Herbert, one of my great favorites as a poet, wrote a poem on perseverance, um, because he was somebody who clearly didn't find the language easy. And it's, it's one of the poems that wasn't published in the 17th century, only in the 20th. And he speaks of um, clinging and crying, crying without cease. It's as if you're clinging to a rock face, crying out. And clinging and crying, crying without cease, thou art my rock, thou art my peace. And that, yes, that rings some bells for me, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have audience, uh, questions from the audience? Claire's just coming forward. Just one or two, I see. <laughs> just to prove that we're not vetting any questions, and this hasn't been pre-planned, I've asked uh, the Archbishop to, to pick the questions. It's like a <laughs> lottery. Absolutely. Take your pick. And if they're illegible, we'll go on to another question. Um, you, you, you will appreciate that I'm not going to get through all of these, but let's see what I can do. There's, uh, let's see. Hmm. <laughs> there's, He's allowed to do that. There's some really very, very interesting ones here. Um, and I'm grouping some together. Um, uh, let's see. Yes, that goes with that, I think. Um, I don't think I'll comment on the United States election. Um, <laughs> tempting as it is. <laughs> I know what I'm afraid of, and I know what I'm afraid of. Um, right. 
here's one about church unity. How close are you to uniting the Anglican and Roman Catholic communions together? Well, you know, I would if I could. But <laughs> it's, you'll understand it, it's not entirely in my hands. I think I'd say about Anglican and Roman Catholic dialogue, some of what applies actually to interreligious dialogue. Understanding is a Christian imperative. The manifest presence of holiness is a challenge. We have to find those areas where the conflicts are real and those where they're just cultural and historical. I've been deeply fed by Roman Catholic spirituality over the years and yet find that there are intellectual questions I can't entirely cement, and I'm grateful for my Anglican heritage. I just hope and pray that at some point, and I can't imagine when, at some point we will be able to be together at the Holy Communion, which is the most important thing, and meanwhile take every opportunity I can of sharing prayer and reflection with my brothers and sisters and, and hoping. Obviously, when we change, when the Anglican Church changes, it can pose new questions for the dialogue. We've had a lot of that. But also, you know, the Roman Catholic Church has changed, perhaps more than it sometimes knows <laughs> over the centuries, and that poses a challenge to us too. So we need to be honest about that, I hope and pray. There are three questions here which are um, connected about atheism, the new atheism, as somebody calls it, are we effective enough in arguing against militant atheism? Is Christianity a beautiful myth and no more? Are we effective? Um, well, I don't know who decides that, really. We're still here, as they say, and I don't think we've, as religious bodies, entirely lost the public argument yet. How new is the new atheism? I think I'd say not very. There are culturally, as you might say, waves of atheist rhetoric that break on the cultural scene. Um, I think I was saying a few weeks ago in another context, um, what, 30, 40 years ago, A.J. Eyre was on the, the chat shows, and 60, 70 years ago, Bertrand Russell was on, they didn't have chat shows then, of course, which is just as well. Um, <laughs> but these waves come and go. I don't feel there's anything actually intellectually new about the latest atheist publications. It doesn't mean they're not serious, but I don't feel there's some great thing which would make you say, oh, damn, I never thought of that. I'd have to stop believing in God. Um, I, that, that's not how it works. It's, it's the same sort of arguments, the same sort of tensions, and there's a question here about um, God as all loving and all powerful, which I'll come to in a moment, the problem of evil, which is one of the biggest. But I don't feel there's anything startlingly fresh here. So we go around the same intellectual, I won't say treadmill, but the same course, dealing with a lot of the same subjects. And what changes people's minds, either in the loss of faith or the acquiring of faith, is, as one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century said, not just argument, but experience at a certain level. That was Wittgenstein. Experience at a certain level. Something triggers the seeing of the universe in another way. And that's partly intellectual, it's partly emotional and imaginative. And that's why responses to the Dawkins, Hitchens, Grayling, Dennett, world is, is bound to be not just at the level of doing the same old arguments. It's also trying to demonstrate why Christianity might be imaginatively powerful, emotionally challenging, as well as intellectually coherent. So plenty of work to do, but I don't think we're, as communities of faith, wholly failing to keep that discussion alive. Um, I did say I'd, I'd respond to the question about the problem of evil, because it always comes up. It's one of those that, again, has no 
definitive answer. I mean, I'd be amazed if anybody went out of this hall tonight saying, I've always been worried about the problem of evil, but the Archbishop finally cleared it up for me. <laughs> you know, if only. <laughs> um, and that's not, again, to trivialize it. If God is all-loving and all-powerful, how do you explain evil? I explain it only to the extent that I can say, God chose to make a world with coherent processes, with the chance of change, and with elements within it that ended up as free agents. Put all that together, and the risk of collision and tension is inbuilt in the very idea of the world. It doesn't make it easy or acceptable. You don't go out and say, oh, well, that's fine. I can now live with the massacre at Bislam, or I can live with the nightmare developing in the Congo at present, or I can live with starvation in southern Sudan. It doesn't mean that. It does mean that there remains some intellectual framework within which you can get some purchase on the question. But the real answer, and I'm sorry, this is a cliche, but it has to be said, the real answer is the fact that people continue to find God credible in places where we imagine he wouldn't be. Those of you who saw that extraordinary drama, God on Trial, on television in the late summer will remember the astonishing spectacle of this group of Jews in Auschwitz arguing about whether God could defend himself against the charge of having abandoned his people, and the verdict is moving inexorably towards a condemnation of God. And then they come to take them to the gas chambers, and the prayer begins. Now, either you find that one of those universe-transforming things, or you find it meaningless. I can't argue into that. There's a couple more, but okay. um, I'll, Do you want to... I, I might come back to those if, if I have a moment. Sure. There's more. Oh, here's a very nice one. Um, can the ancient ethic of hospitality pose a possible alternative to the concept of religious toleration? Three cheers for the questioner. Um, tolerance is, to me, a very flabby word. It, it doesn't sound terribly... Um, well, welcoming. If I tolerate somebody else's behavior, that usually means I look sideways at them with my lips compressed, <laughs> occasionally uttering a meaningful sigh. Mm -hmm. Hospitality means I am actually grateful to have you in my territory and engaging with you. And certainly, when dialogue means more than just the exchange of words, it's I think this is part of what you were saying at the beginning, wasn't it, Mona? Hospitality is, is an image that can be used reciprocally. So, yes, thank you for that. Um, here's an interesting one about China. Considering that religion in China was until recent years illegal and religious expression is still limited, what, in your opinion, will be the consequences in the future if this is liberalized? Will the religious vacuum be filled with... Uh, Rapid uptake in religious belief, with what consequences and which religions? Very good question. Um, and quite pertinent, as I spent a bit of time in China just uh, two years ago, and we're trying to maintain a fairly steady program of inviting religious scholars from China to Britain annually for some seminars here. One of the effects of long-term repression of religion is, of course, that religious bodies lose some of their self-confidence. They lose some of their, I don't know, their sense of being able to cope. They turn inwards. You saw it with the church in Russia and elsewhere in Eastern Europe. To some extent, it's true of the church in China. Now, here is a, a door of opportunity for the churches. And are the churches equipped to take it up? Well, not very well. And so churches elsewhere, I think, need to be alongside churches, official and unofficial in China, 
trying to deepen their understanding to um, help them to cope with the challenges of a very complex society. I think that the future for Christianity in China is, is very promising, but also for other religious traditions. And it'll be interesting to see what, what the future would be, let's say, for a renewed and re more relaxed Buddhism in China. It'll be interesting to see whether the very distinctive um, Islamic history that's part of Chinese history generates an Islamic style or ethos that's distinctively Chinese, as it did in the Middle Ages. Um, so I think there's, there's a great deal to play for there. It's a very interesting time. There's still a bit of a gap between intellectuals and others who are fascinated by religion and its possibilities and what the religious organizations can provide because they've been sort of cramped and impoverished by years of repression. So lots, lots to do there. You were heard to quote Karl Marx recently. Could you elaborate on how you see this somewhat controversial figure as relevant to today's political, economic, and religious climate? I, I enjoy seeing Karl Marx described as a somewhat controversial figure. <laughs> um, what I said, I think, a few weeks ago was that Marx was right about one thing, though about little else. What I think Marx was right about was an analysis of the way in which the whole post-industrial revolution capitalist story leads you to a curious kind of mythology where you ascribe reality and power and independence and agency to things that actually you've made, to your profits, your money, your market. And Marx's challenge is not simply, oh, let, you know, let's tear up the whole system and start again, though that's part of what he's suggesting. It's also a challenge about how you actually reclaim the human ownership of things that human beings have made. That is how economics and social interaction and social class, how all of those become human actions and relations again, not just dictated by impersonal laws. And that's a, Complicated, interesting, worthwhile question, I think. What Marx was wrong about would take a very long time to unpack. I think he was uh, really very substantially wrong about religion. Surprise, surprise. He was substantially wrong about where revolution would happen. One of the great difficulties that the Russian Revolution faced was that it was against all the textbook predictions. Russia was absolutely the wrong place for the revolution to start because it was a pre-industrial economy. Um, so, you know, he's got a lot to answer for. And he's got a, a lot to answer for in the sense that he also encouraged that ludicrous, secular version of religious language which says there is a fixed, lasting, unchallengeable good time just around the corner and we can bring it into being. And if, you know, if that were true, then perhaps any amount of sacrifice would be, would be necessary and justifiable for it. People like Stalin thought it was true, and they thought inhuman levels of sacrifice were justifiable, and that is one of the most appalling blasphemies and disasters of the modern age. Um. Uh, let's see. I have one here you yep. might like to answer. Yep. And, Thank you. Oh, yes. The British Humanist Society has been advertising on buses with the slogan, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. <laughs> Is it hypocritical of them to preach a message in this way? What do you think about advertising religious beliefs in general? The trouble with advertising anything, whether it's humanism or religion, is that it assumes there is a product and a consumer. And I don't think that Muhammad or St. Francis of Assisi or Martin Luther or Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Mahatma Gandhi would have been terribly impressed with the idea that religion was a product looking for a market. So you know, anything else I say is under the rubric of can we try and get out of the omnipresent market mythology, the ones here. Oh, no. 
There is, I think, a reasonable place for trying to jolt people into thinking it's worth thinking. And that's why I don't think adverts from the British Humanist Society are the end of the world. Already it's provoked a bit of public discussion, and um, delightfully, I think many people have quite rightly noted that the word probably is a frightfully English way of <laughs> coming at things. There's probably no God. Garrison Keillor, the great American, human, um, American humorist, wrote uh, an essay some years ago on shy rights, which is a, a wonderful um, satire on certain kinds of human rights appeals, and imagined you know, the, the shy rights demonstration in which nobody turns up, and, um, and the great slogan of the shy movement, shy rights, why not quite soon? Um, and I, I feel the humanist advert has a little touch of that about it. But it's got people talking. What is this word probably? And why is it assumed that if there is a God, you ought to worry and stop enjoying your life? What if religion has something to do with joy? That's not a bad question to raise. So yes, get people thinking. But don't imagine that it's marketing. I think that that way madness lies. This is a little bit linked, and you might want to answer this in the follow-up to that. Can you envisage a secular saint? A secular saint? Um, in the full sense of the word, no, I can't, because I think my sense of what the holy means is somebody with an active, loving relationship with the transcendent reality of God. So full sanctity, I, I, can't, you know, I can't ascribe there. Now, that being said, I can certainly envisage, I can't just envisage, I know people who would call themselves secularists in whom I would see marks of holiness in the sense of being both deeply and constructively critical of themselves, hopeful about themselves, and yet somehow at home with the world. You know, it's, it's an echo of what I call holiness, and it's very real, and it poses some of the questions that we touched on earlier. And that's why I don't want to rush too quickly to saying <coughs> the question is just closed. I can't describe holiness in the full sense to someone who does not believe in God. I can ascribe goodness, and I can see echoes of what I mean by holiness, and I think some people are related to more than they realize. A couple of weeks ago, it was the um, 50th anniversary of Vaughan Williams' death, and I find myself preaching in Canterbury Cathedral on Vaughan Williams. Now, Vaughan Williams, of course, wrote transcendent, wonderful music for Christian worship, and yet described himself as, when he was a young man as an atheist, and his widow described him as a cheerful agnostic in later life. Certainly someone who in his convictions was secular, and yet in his imagination and his spirit is constantly pushing at the bounds of, of the world and opening out onto mystery. Also a man whose personal life, with one or two dramatic hiccups, was gentle, affirming, generous, loving, all those things, and in which I see, again, echoes, something not a million miles from holiness. Getting all that into a sermon was quite hard work, but I think I want to say I do thank God for Vaughan Williams and for his life and feel that there are things there which any person of faith ought to be very, very grateful for and feel humbled by. Can I come yes, back to, uh, there's a couple here which I put on one side hoping that the brain would somehow engage with them while talking about other things, because they're a bit difficult. But here's an easy one, or easy-ish. Which of your predecessors as Archbishop of Canterbury do you most identify with and why? <coughs> um, three names. Anselm Canterbury, and I don't identify with Anselm because he was, he was one of these saints that I've been talking about, but he was somebody who tried to hold together the management of the church, the thinking through of the faith, 
and a life of prayer. And um, those are three things which archbishops of Canterbury ought to try and hold together. And however unsuccessfully, I, th I think that's what I've got to try and do. I think I have a lot of sympathy with Thomas Cranmer. He, <laughs> he was an academic who suddenly found he had to take decisions. Um, <laughs> Uh, perhaps I'll say no more than that. <laughs> but more recently, um, of course, Michael Ramsey, who was Archbishop when I was a teenager, was somebody who in his, again, like Anselm, his willingness to try and hold together the engagement with social reality, the intellectual challenge, and the spiritual imperative, just um, opens the horizon, and someone I love and admire hugely. And uh, a question here about um, Cardinal Keith O'Brien's comments comparing the removal of tissue from incapacitated adults and children 